We are horrified by the Israeli strikes that killed civilians in Rafa. The scale of the human suffering and tragedy we're seeing in Gaza must cease. Canada in no way supports the military operations by Israel in Rafa. Indeed, we have been calling for a ceasefire, including at the UN, since December, and will continue to. We need to see much more humanitarian aid flow in to Gaza, and we need to see all hostages released. La tragédie et la souffrance à Gaza doit cesser. Nous sommes horrifiés par les frappes israéliennes qui ont tué des civils à Rafah. En d'aucune façon, le Canada n'appuie les opérations d'Israël, d'Israël militaire à Rafah. Nous appelons depuis le mois de décembre pour un cessez-le-feu immédiat, y compris à l'ONU. Nous avons besoin de voir beaucoup plus d'aide humanitaire rentrer pour aider les civils à Gaza et nous avons besoin de voir tous les otages. Well, I just want to begin by extending our deepest sympathies to everyone that has been affected by this massive landslide. Uh, we hear of hundreds of people who have uh, been, uh, been killed. Um, and so we are in touch with our international trusted partners on the ground to better understand the needs of those who are affected. And then once we get that information, we'll be able to respond in a, in a very effective and impactful way. Uh, and, and we continue to monitor the situation as it unfolds. And do you foresee Canada giving uh, any humanitarian aid or perhaps boots on the ground in Dart or something else? I, I, would, I would definitely say that uh, we, I can see a situation in which, depending on the information that we get, we'll be, we're on standby to provide any humanitarian aid that is necessary. Uh, because this is a, a big, big... Uh, impactful landslide, uh, hundreds of people killed, uh, and it's affecting the environment as well and the infrastructure. So we'll do whatever we can together with our partners, and we're already in very close contact with, with, the, with our international partners on the ground on how best to respond to this. And can you tell me a little bit more about uh, your conversations with international partners? Are there certain things that they're asking for at this time? Or is there uh, anything, uh, I guess, what are, what are the nature of those discussions? Usually, I mean, I, I don't want to speculate on this particular example, but normally in these kinds of situations, we get requests for, uh, you know, shelter, uh, materials, food, water, sanitation materials, as well as uh, med medicines. And so we'll, we'll wait to see what comes back from that uh, request for information. Based on the information we get, we'll be able to respond most effectively uh, based on our capacities on the ground. And is there any uh, like rough timeline that you're expecting uh, for a request to be made, for example? Uh, very quickly, we, we, we expect to get that, the feedback from our trusted partners on the ground very quickly. Once we get that information, in the, hopefully in the next few hours, we'll be able to do that assess what, what is needed and what we can do to contribute to that international response. And to your knowledge, are there any uh, Canadian individuals who are affected by this or have family there? We, we, I know that Global Affairs Canada is, uh, is trying to confirm uh, that information, but uh, at this time I cannot confirm that. That's really fine. Uh, was there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to add about the situation at all? No, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Thanks very much for your Thank time. You. Je m'attends rien de moins du NPD parce que juste depuis trois ans, c'est tout ce qu'ils font, c'est de sauver ce gouvernement-là qui ne mérite pas d'être là. Puis aujourd'hui, je m'attends qu'ils vont sauver la peau du président qui lui non plus ne devrait pas être là. Pensez-vous que c'est la peau de Pensez-vous que c'est le prévu changement? Ben là, c'est sûr, il faudrait demander au NPD, là. Et à un moment donné, je pense que le, le président ne devrait même pas être supporté par l'NPD. Ça devrait même pas faire part de leur espèce d'entente, parce que là, c'est spécifique au président, aux gestes commis par le président, qui sont non acceptables pour un poste comme la présidente de la Chambre de commerce. Ingérence étrangère, rapidement, votre collègue, M. Chung, disait qu'il faut pousser pour faire avancer le projet de loi C-70 oui. pour moderniser oui. les processus. Il y a encore un rapport hier qui fait tant de problèmes de... 
partage d'informations. Vous êtes d'accord avec ça, l'idée oui. d'accélérer ce projet de loi? Oui, absolument, c'est très important. Puis on sait qu'il y a des problèmes de gérance étrangère. Le gouvernement a déposé un projet de loi qu'on est prêt à, à supporter d'aller de l'avant rapidement. Donc, on espère que le gouvernement va procéder afin qu'à la prochaine élection, on ait les outils disponibles pour protéger notre élection. Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un à blâmer euh, à la lumière du rapport que vous avez vu hier? Est-ce qu'il y a des gens qui ont juste de mauvaise foi, d'après vous, dans, dans C'est difficile pour moi de répondre à cette question-là, mais il reste que ça fait des années qu'on en parle. Le gouvernement traîne en longueur. Euh, là, maintenant, s'ils sont prêts à aller plus rapidement et à sauver les meubles, comme on dit, tant mieux. Mais il reste que c'est le passé garant de l'avenir. On est plus ou moins certain. Merci. Amount of threats that have gone way up to MPs like yourself from the public. Uh, just wondering, how, so how are the they? The amount of what? Threats. Uh, threats to the oh. person from, from the yeah. public. And when you span, are you facing these sort of things in the last year? Well, um, you mean in terms of harassment, in harassment terms of. And almost to the point of criminality is where we're, we're well, living. Right. 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 Um, I think that the politics uh, today have changed, uh, and the discourse with the public has also changed. Uh, and over the years, I've been in elected office for 30 years now, and I've certainly seen a difference and a shift uh, in terms of that behavior, which I think is really unfortunate. Um, targeted, I think, not just for myself, but for many others. And it can take in a variety of different forms. Uh, it could be, you know, a phone call uh, that could be very aggressive. Uh, there are times where really I have had outright racist comments, uh, sexist comments from people, uh, and sometimes even threatening uh, language that's used. I've had over the years uh, where my office has been smashed in, Uh, as an example, I've had people come into my office to make verbal threats of me where we had to call the authorities. Uh, on social media is rampant, uh, as an example. That's so, last year, that's sort of the area that we're looking at. Um, it's happened uh, over the course of the years in different formats, for sure. In the last year, um, you know, the ongoing, uh, you know, anonymous phone calls, anonymous emails, and those are the kind of things have continued, just never stopped for me, to be honest with you. Uh, and then there are moments, depending on what's going on uh, in the media cycle, actually, sometimes can that could generate activity uh, in that way. And so most certainly I've seen it in the last year, but really in essence though, I've seen it throughout the entire course of my political career. The report uh, that came out yesterday about foreign interference and the problems of flow of communications between the security agencies and the PMO. Is there somebody to blame and is it not a bit alarming what's got, what the content of that? Well, it is absolutely alarming from this perspective. We know that foreign interference is real, is impacting Canadian society and our democracy. Uh, the commissioner has actually issued an interim report to say that there were foreign interference activities in both the 2019 and 2021 elections. Whether we have changed the outcome of the election, the answer is no, and we accept that. But it doesn't mean to say foreign interference activities have not taken place. And so in light of this report, what is alarming, of course, is that while the government has multiple agencies addressing this issue, they're all disconnected. They all kind of, you know, separately doing their own thing. They can't even come to basic agreements or a set of standards uh, on when to ensure that this information is passed on to um, the prime minister uh, and the prime minister's office as an example. So that is very alarming. That is an aside, we're also heard, we also heard from the foreign interference uh, inquiry, contradictory information. So take for example, you have Katie Telford from the prime minister's office saying at committee that of course the prime minister reads all uh, foreign interference or top secret uh, uh, documents. Uh, that is in relation to national interest. Then you have the prime minister who comes on to say, I don't read any of that. So unless if I'm brief verbally, I wouldn't know about it. I mean, right there is a, a huge problem that tells you where things are at. And so, you know, what we do need uh, is a, a concerted effort and a coordinated effort and one lead agency who's responsible for this so that things don't fall through the gaps. And too, it's too easy and too important just to say, oh, gee, sorry, I didn't know about it.
And, and what does it tell you about this situation that you went through? Uh, you know, what, what could uh, what could be the link? To, uh, does it explain anything for, about your case in particular? Well, in part, um, you know, uh, at the inquiry, one of the issues that I raised was, in fact, that, um, you know, you, you, you know, it's kind of like having a recipe and there are a whole bunch of people who have parts of the ingredients. And in order for the product, let's say you're baking a cake and for the cake to come out right and well, you'd have to have all the ingredients put in at the right time at the right, you know, and, 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 and to bake the cake in this hole. But right now we have a system that's half baked. And so consequently we have these problems. Are you worried that the safety, public safety minister knew uh, prior to 2021 in some cases and nothing was done? Well, this is what we need to find out. And that's part of the uh, inquiry's mandate. Who knew what, when, and what did the government do about it? The inquiry did not address that question in this interim report. I'm really hoping that we will. And what is required, of course, is for the commissioner to get the cabinet documents and so that they can get the answers so that we can have the trust and faith um, that this is going to be yeah, properly sure. addressed. I just to follow on from the PROC committee where I believe you heard that uh, uh, complaints against members of the public. Uh, members, members of parliament. Members, exactly. The members of public actually oh. against members of parliament have gone up 800% or something. Yeah, like from that. 7 to I think it was 593. Yeah, I was, I, I mean, given my experience, it's sort of tracks with what what I've experienced, but I was surprised to hear the numbers, yeah. It's it's really disappointing. Do you think there's a way to, I don't want to solve it, right, but uh, is there a way to move, get that number down to make lives better for parliamentarians and for public? I think all of us need to call out um, abusive behavior when we see it, and that includes the public. Um, I think too often we're intimidated into not saying anything. Um, but it, but it's a troubling trend, and and I, you know, I worry that um, something's going to happen to somebody. You know that uh, these 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 uh, those are the ones that they've looked into. I I I I'm I'm worried. Do you think it's just uh, liberals that are getting no. the hardest part? No, it's not. I mean, I think I I think. Um, one of the Conservatives MPs said you probably get it worse because you're in government. Um, but I do, I think it's across the board, I think women get it worse than men. And um, I, I think racialized MPs also get it worse than, than others. So I, but I don't think it's specific to a party. And Charlie Angus has talked about um, what's happened with him and his daughters being, um, you know, stuff being put on. And, and that's becoming a trend too, where families are being involved, right? You, I think you spoke about a bunch about the relationship. Yeah. Are, are you still getting as like that, or is that sort of a strong against that? Um, it's it, it not as I wouldn't say not as much. I don't know when it's going to happen, right? So I think that's the the worry, and some of my colleagues have uh, talked about that as well, where they um, they're always looking over their shoulder. I'm actually testifying at Proc on Thursday, so. I'll be able to. Thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, your staff obviously are much. Uh, they're usually folks who are between 22 and 35 generally. But um, is there anything you can do for them? Uh, well, you know, I I know that we can refer them on to for you know for counseling, mental health supports. But quite honestly, the the CHRO at committee today was talking about how there's lots of demand for talent. And quite honestly, when you've got young people who have a job or any age, not just young people, but a job where you're being abused by the public, um, why stay, right? And I worry about that. My staff is amazing. They're, they're incredible. Most people that work for MPs are, are amazing. And I've told them they don't have to put up with that abuse, but it's, um, you know, it's more and more common. And just recapping, you were proc this morning when you heard the, the numbers from, from the common staff, what was your just uh, disappointment. Uh, I was disappointed to see those numbers, but not really surprised. And I'm just wondering, what, have you faced anything from the public in the last year in Brampton at your constituency office? Not trying to make Bramptonians be bad people, but, <laughs> but it's challenging times out there. I'm probably one of the luckier ones uh, in terms of the respect that my constituents give, but uh, 
But absolutely, there's, you know, I hear as the whip as well from a lot of members that uh, times are very different, whether it's online or in person. Um, and I'm not immune to that either. Um, but some, some members have it worse than others. As Chief Government Whip, what can you do? Well, um, I've been working with the Sergeant in Arms quite a bit uh, to figure out how we can be more on top of it, um, really assess the thresholds of threat ahead of time. And they have, uh, they have upped the amount of personnel they have. There's more coordination with local police forces. Um, there's a quite, a, quite a lot that's going into it. And I guess the other thing is, what is the difference between actually just unhappy constituents with a policy or with you know, performance of an MP and actual threat? Is there, is there, what's, what's the, the magic moment for you or changes into something like that? Oh, absolutely. It's very different. Uh, it is more violent and um, um, threats against someone's life and family and, and those types of things that we're talking about. We're not talking about those that are unsatisfied or um, are advocating for different policies. Uh, we're talking about those that want to hurt um, members for particular reasons. And is it more women than men or is it more... Uh Folks I'm visibly different, or I just yeah. I just don't know, so I'm asking. Yeah, absolutely. You've you've got it. You've hit it right on the mark. Um, it is more women. Uh, visible minorities are targeted more as well, but um, but male colleagues are facing it too. So there's various reasons, but we've just seen that there's a, a real rise, um, a rise in this type of behavior. Then, and I don't think other even if you talk to politicians from the past. They don't recall this type of activity or this type of um, threatening feeling or a feeling of unsafety that they used to have. So times are changing. And is there a way to solve it? I, I, I ask, it's a simple question, but obviously the answer is... The answer is very complex to how we solve this. Um, I, I don't know. Like I really do sincerely feel that um, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Um, a lot of, what do they call it, like a rage machine and all of that on social media, certain social media pages, you know, they're not like um, the way journalists used to present their news stories. They present it in ways so that they can get the most kind of angry feedback so that they can monetize. And, and I think that's adding to uh, the type of behavior that people are exhibiting. They almost feel emboldened to go out and um, make these types of threats. So I, I don't know, it's a new world we're living in, right? Um, even when I first became a member in 2015, uh, we were using social media, but not to the extent we are now. And so, and it's not being, it's being used in a much more negative way than it ever was. So I don't know, we, I think we all just need to work together to figure out um, a better way forward. I know journalists are dealing with this type of, uh, these types of threats and behavior as well. So I think a lot of people are facing it. It's not just politicians. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sergeant Arms says harassment against MPs is way, way up. Are you experiencing that in North Vancouver? Or is there anything you could think could be done to change things? I, I mean, I know many of my colleagues have been experiencing harassment, and some of them even uh, to their homes. Um, so certainly it has been on the rise. I mean, I, I've been fortunate in North Vancouver. I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, but certainly I do think that... Um, we all want to attract good people into politics, irrespective of partisan strife. I think we need to think about how we dial down the rhetoric and we try to actually find ways in which to ensure that MPs feel safe. Thank you. Sergeant Arms says harassment against MPs is way, way up. Are you experiencing any of that in Halifax? Uh, this is very serious. Um, what I'm more worried about is my staff. So we've taken some significant, I'm out of breath running up the hill. Ukraine. We've taken some significant measures at my MP office to make sure that staff are safe. Um, that uh, there, you know, there, there are always tense moments. There, there can be tense moments in MP offices. We've had some of those. And um, I've, given, I've given direction to my staff to uh, take advantage of every offer that the sergeant mm -hmm. is making to make their workplace more secure. Is there, is there something like switching to appointment only? I'm not advocating for that. I'm just sort of fishing on what, what, what you're doing that you can speak about publicly. Yeah, so there are cameras and uh, when, when you know, we have some threat, threat assessment, when threat is high, we switch to appointment only. 
Um, so it's become very much a fluid situation. We much prefer to have the open door policy and drop in policy. And when we don't perceive a threat or are not advised that there's an immediate threat, um, we uh, operate that way. But um, the safety of the staff comes first. And so if, there, if the police or the sergeant at arms let us know that there is a, a hot spot, then we switch to appointment only. Yeah. Okay, for sure. The sergeant at arms says harassment against MPs is way up, something like 800%. In Surrey, are you facing stuff like that? And how are you dealing with it if you are facing it? I've been very fortunate, haven't had too many incidents, I would say, and especially in the last few years, but there's a lot of members of Parliament who are facing a lot, and it's on both sides of the house. Do you think there's a way to solve things, or, or tips to, you know, move to appointment only, or CCTV? I'm just throwing ideas out there, I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the civility has to get better, and I think that as leaders uh, of all parties, they need to demonstrate that, and I think... Uh, uh, society as a whole should do that. It's, I think, an overall look. So you can oppose people, not like them, but you don't need to yell at them or swear at them or uh, do threats. And I think that's a bigger picture and a bigger uh, conversation. But in the meantime, I think there are items that the Sergeant at Arms is looking at to make it more secure, specifically for female uh, members of Parliament as well. well. Last question for you. Is is there a secret for your part of Surrey that, that is just better off than some people's writings where they're, they're facing some heavy duty stuff? No, I'm a pretty accessible person, so it's not a, there's no surprise to see me. I'm on a ground floor office. I'm engaged in the city, so, but I, I don't think that really determines it. I just like I have, a, I have great constituents that are understanding in that regards. They may disagree, but they'll express it a different way. Beyond harassment, any threats from foreign actors? You know, we've heard allegations of MPs targeting MPs here. Have you ever had any kind of a security consultation about that type of thing? I've had, we, we've had, many MPs have had uh, consultations, and I included uh, have had a consultation, but I've, I've been uh, relatively uh, safe, I think, with that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. And how are things going for you in Woodbridge Vaughan? Like, are you facing that sort of thing with your constituents? Uh, what I can say is very, very clearly, from when I first was elected in 2015 to what is happening today, personally, uh, the amount of harassment, threats, social media, and direct messages that you receive, uh, people coming and banging on your constituency door, uh, and sometimes sitting at a coffee shop and being given the bird by people, uh, even to that extent, the amount of visceral uh, feedback sometimes you get from individuals uh, has significantly increased. It's, it's disappointing. You want to be out there. You want to be accountable and transparent and accessible to all your citizens, you know, your residents, and do the best job you can. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the divisiveness and the tone of it has uh, put a little bit of a sour grapes onto that. Is there a way to deal with that to protect you, protect your staff, because that's, I think, what Proc was looking at a little bit. I think the, the increased resources that parliament, par, parliamentarians uh, need, if you're a minister and, and so forth, obviously you, ne you need to be covered. Uh, I think that would happen in any democracy, any other government. Uh, I think for the MPs, having uh, making sure you have the, the button that you need to contact the RCMP. I know our home uh, has a security system that uh, was offered to all MPs, so I encourage everyone to take a, take a to utilize that that resource. Uh, I think having the constant communications with your local police force, in our case, York Region Police, is very important. Uh, things have changed a little bit. I hopefully think things are getting better, uh, but unfortunately, since 2015, it's it's uh, significantly deteriorated. And for your constituency, are you moving to uh, on appointments only at, at times, or? or no, I, I, I don't want to do that. I, I want to make sure our constituency is open to our residents. They, they, they do need an appointment because sometimes we won't be able to help assist them when they come, and we don't want to disrupt their lives if they're at work during the day. Uh, but no, I want to make sure, you know, we live in a democracy. Our, uh, I, as a public servant, and my staff are accountable to our, our residents and our voters, and we want to be accessible to them, absolutely. We don't want to create that distance. Thank you for good to see you. You're welcome, likewise.